Mr. Chancellor, it is my great pleasure to present Christina M. Johnson, an exceptional teacher, scholar, inventor, and administrator. An electrical engineer by training, Dr. Johnson's pioneering research and entrepreneurial abilities have had a major impact on our profession and resulted in important social and economic benefits worldwide. Her leadership roles at Johns Hopkins University and Duke University are indicative of her visionary approach to education, and she has built on her success in academia to become a keen proponent of the strategic role that research universities such as McGill play in our society. More recently, Dr. Johnson served as Under Secretary of Energy for U.S. President Barack Obama and spearheaded an aggressive national plan to reduce greenhouse emissions and promote sustainable, sustainable clean energy. Mr. Chancellor, I present to you Christina M. Johnson so that you may confer upon her the degree of Doctor of Science Honoris Causa. Amazing, uh, following what uh, Professor LeBeau said, when I think back to 60 years ago when I graduated, there was every few years there might be one engineer who was a woman and almost never a female architect graduate. And today, just look around you. What a joy and what a, an honor it is for McGill to have been part of this whole revolution. Thank, thank, and thank you to both of you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure now to invite Dr. Christina Johnson to deliver the convocation address. Dr. Johnson. Bonjour, Chancellor Steinberg, Prince, Principal and Vice Chancellor Fortier, and Vice Chair Genereau, governors, distinguished guests, family, friends, and fellow graduates of the 2014 graduating class of the Faculty of Engineering. Congratulations. You are now well prepared to enter a world where you will have to grapple with very difficult questions such as, so let me understand this. I'm receiving a degree as a reward for four years of rigorous engineering studies, and we are getting a degree without ever going to lab or taking an exam. What gives with that? Well, as you're a commencement speaker, I'm supposed to impart all sorts of life's lessons. So let's get the first one done. Life isn't fair, but it counts. And I'm sure you know that because I'm sure there are times when you didn't get the grade you wanted in a class or a lab or an exam. And we all know that good things just don't happen on their own. It takes hard work, it takes discipline, and above all, it takes persistence and unwavering commitment. So I'm going to talk today about three kinds of commitment. The commitment to optimism, the commitment to kindness, and the commitment to community. So let me begin with optimism. When I was 21, I wanted to be an Olympic athlete. That was my dream. You know, I learned later I didn't quite have the talent, but we'll get there. So I was training in 1980 with other Olympic hopefuls, and just a few months after my own graduation at the age of 22, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, a cancer of the lymph system. And when my doctor was telling me this, he said, you know, if it doesn't go well, I might only have two, day, two days, two years to live. It seemed like two days. And at that moment, I literally felt like the walls were closing in on me. And as he was continuing to talk on and on about the disease, I think he knew I wasn't listening. So he finally said, but if we catch it in the early stages, you'll have a good chance to live a normal life. And as soon as he said there was a chance, 
I knew I was going to live. I just knew it. I would have been shocked if I didn't. And as I recovered, I learned that being positive is a powerful tool. And like your diploma, it can crack open any door. And when combined with persistence, if you keep pushing and pushing, you will open that door. You are graduating into a world where bad things can happen to good people. And when they do, I hope you'll commit to staying positive. And when you find yourself in dark moments, which you will, remember what Martin Luther King said, only when it was dark enough can we see the stars. The second type of commitment I'd like to talk about is a commitment to be kind. Be kind to yourself and to others. But as an adult, you will be tempted to put yourself first. Sometimes you'll worry that if you don't, you won't succeed. You'll fall behind. At these moments, you'll have a choice to make. I had such a choice early again in my career. I was going to my very first cancer treatment. And again, like you, many of you, I was 22 years old. I put on a brave face, I walked into the waiting room, and I said hello to two elderly women, sisters in fact, much like my sisters that are here today, not elderly, but sisters, um, who were interned in Japan during World War II. They were tough. One of the sisters looked up at me and asked, is this your first time? And I said, yes. How did you know? And she looked at me and said, you look scared. Now I was crushed, because truthfully, I was scared. I didn't know what to expect, but I didn't think I was showing it. After a few weeks, I had the drill down. I would go to class, and then research lab, I was now a graduate student. A short training run, which is all my health would allow, radiation treatment, and then home to study. It actually wasn't too bad. One afternoon, a new person showed up at the waiting room. And I looked at her as she walked in, and I said, is this your first time? And she said, yes. How did you know? I looked over at the two sisters, and I winked, and I replied, well, you weren't here yesterday. We all come at the same time, so I figured it had to be your first time. Then I proceeded to walk her through what was going to happen. At the end, I told her simply, just think of something nice. A few minutes later, her name was called. I could see the fear, the same fear I had felt. She was entering what we called the rad room. And as she entered, she turned back, and over her shoulder, she said, I'm going to think of you. I learned what the poet and writer Maya Angelou said was true. People will forget what you say. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget the way you made them feel. At that moment, she made me feel like a million dollars. I had a choice to make to be kind and expecting nothing in return, and this stranger gave me one of my life's sweetest memories. Lastly, let's talk about a commitment to community. Whether it's our province or our country or our planet, these things are something we all share and we're all responsible for them. And this responsibility was at the heart of my time with the Obama administration and now as CEO of my own company. To live in the 21st century, we need energy. We can't change that fact. But today, the price we pay for energy is too high. I'm not just talking about the number that's on our utility bills or the price at the pump. We pay a price in pollutants that contribute to human health problems. We pay a price in greenhouse gas emissions and global climate change, which threaten our civilization and the extinction of many species. The science leaves no doubt. We cannot keep doing what we're doing. We need to change. And that won't be easy. We need to start by deciding to waste less energy in our daily lives. There's three things we can do that it's quite simple. The first is we can wash our clothes in warm water, in cold water, excuse me. <laughs> I know you're laughing, students, because who's done laundry lately? But anyway, <laughs> if we all just wash our clothes in cold water, we'd save 5% of energy consumption, which is significant. Or we could just, as I said before, do less laundry. If we each drove just 10 miles less per week, one trip, in the US, it'd be the equivalent of taking 10 million cars off the road. In Canada, it'd be the equivalent of taking more than a million cars off the road. And if we all unplug devices, when we're not using them, we can save so-called vampire electricity, which again, in the US, would be enough electricity to power 3 million homes. And in Canada, hundreds of thousands of homes. These are steps we can all take today to preserve our environment and preserve that environment for the next generation of McGill graduates. 
I've talked today about optimism, kindness, and community or citizenship. They are all essential ingredients for enjoying a flavorful life. Let me conclude by saying that I'd like to acknowledge my fellow honorary degree recipient, Dr. Blanche Van Gickel. Your daughter Brenda told me, and I quote, you worked quietly and harder not to be a successful woman, but to succeed at what you were doing. And as a result, your legacy happened because you were smart, hardworking, and determined. Thank you for a career of service to society through preservation and the realization of modern structural beauty. So today, as you prepare to leave this university you've called home, use what you've learned at McGill to make someone's life better. If you do, you'll find success, you'll find opportunity, and you'll leave the kind of legacy your children can learn from. When I began this speech, I was sort of joking around, why are we up here? But I'd like to answer that seriously. I'm here, and Dr. Van Ginkle is here, because more than any technology or policy, it's young people like you who give us all hope. It's you, and it's all that you are about to do. I made a choice one day to be kind and expecting nothing in return. Go Big Red, or Go Red Go, and congratulations to the class of 2014 to your kindness, your optimism, and your commitment to community. Thank you.